Hey, it's Tim here. In this video, 22.3 is out and the coming soon page is up. So we're just gonna go through all the features that are on the coming soon page to quickly scout what's in this release. Let's get stuck in. Okay, so here we are. This is the coming soon page. Now I haven't been on YouTube for a while. Stick around to the end to find out why. We're gonna get straight into this page because I have to be honest, I think it's taken a really, really, really long time to find out what's in this release. Largely because the beta itself didn't have that many features we could test. And so um, a lot of people have been sort of anticipating this particular page or the announcement from Tablet telling you what's coming up. And it's sort of weird because the way I found out about this page was actually on Tableau Online. I went to try and fix a problem and I just stumbled across this. To me, that's not how these things should work. But anyway, we've got the features. We're going to go through them right now. So the first one is something called Data Guide. Now, I haven't been through this page in advance, so I'm going to sort of, you're going to get the first impression of these as I go through them. Um, so let's have a look at this. So Data Guide is a new pane that provides a helpful information about dashboard and the data behind it. So essentially what this is, is a little pane on the right hand side. If you haven't sort of noticed recently, Tableau added this side pane on the right hand side of a dashboard that sort of comes up with explained data. And in essence, that sort of side pane has been getting more populated with information about data sets, explain data, a bunch of other data metrics now live there. And now this feature, Data Guide. And the really nice thing about this is it's trying to help you understand what's going on on the dashboard. It, think of it as like a tour guide for the dashboard, but in a much, much more sort of considered way than we're kind of used to. At the moment, what a user has to do is build a dashboard with maybe tooltips and put the information in uh, icons and when you hover over those icons, you get little descriptors telling what's going on. Mark Reed, Tableau Visionary, has also done this sort of nice technique on his blog where he shows you how to create this overlay that sort of goes on top of a dashboard. And um, this is something a little bit more considered using the UI to help you do that. So I'm going to be pretty keen to see how this works. Uh, you do get this little GIF that kind of gives you a flavor of how it works. Um, but what's interesting about this release is that this feature sounds like more than just one thing. So if you look here, it says, Data Guide also introduces two new tools to help you decide which parts of the dashboard to focus on so you can get insights faster, explain the viz and data change radar. So explain the viz, um, that's going to be an interesting one because we just had data stories, which, you know, there's a lot of things that now have start to populate the same space. So explain the viz, scans your dashboards for outlier measures and potential key drivers behind them. Data change radar, on the other hand, for Tableau Cloud only, hint, hint. Uh, tracks measure values in your dashboard over time and automatically flags unexpected values outside of normal business patterns as data refreshes. So let's break that down. Explain the viz. Sounds like explain data. So that's that's going to be an interesting one. I, I'm kind of going to want to see how explain the viz and explain data are different. Maybe explain the viz and explain data are the same thing. Uh, just rebranded. Who knows? Data change radar is a really cool feature because what it has to do to be able to tell you about things that are changing is be taking snapshots of that data set over time. Because of course, if your data set updates with refresh extracts, then this is actually going to need to keep a snapshot to tell you, oh, by the way, this value has changed beyond what is normal over a period of time. And it's gonna to need to use that data to show you that trend. So that's gonna be a really interesting feature. So data guide is huge. Um, I. You know, there's a lot packed in there. It's going to be really good for companies that have a lot of effort when it comes to uh, helping users understand uh, dashboards. It's going to help with data literacy in some contexts, and I think it will help take the pressure off um, off uh, dashboard developers to have to sort of cram all this stuff into their dashboards, which then slows the dashboards down. Having it as part of the Chrome is going to really, really help. So that's going to be an interesting feature to see. Next up, table extension. So this is really nice. Um, at the moment, you can already work with R and Python using TabPy and um, the R capability that you can integrate through analytics extensions. This is different because with that information, what you have to do is you have to pipe all those calculations to the uh, relevant analytics extensions APIs and then the data comes back, but you can't do it in real time. What table extensions allows you to do is essentially pipe calculations in real time to these services. So um, it's going to be hard to sort of explain the nuance of this, but you can see here that um, this works at the connection level like any other data source would, rather than working at the calculation level where things are then pre-computed into the data set. So this is going to be uh, really, really interesting to see how this works. We're going to have to try and find some new use cases. Um, the one they've got here, I think it's a model that's identifying objects within an image and it's doing it uh, using an image object, which is a hint. 
to something we saw at conference. So that's going to be something to uh, look forward to. I'd love to see this demo in earnest. Uh, whoever built this demo, if, if you're out there watching this video, um, you know, post post that data set somewhere. Uh, tell us what libraries you're using so we can recreate the demo and see how that works. Um, I got a real issue with my scroll wheel today. It's, it's, it's everywhere. We're going to have to use a side scroll here. Dynamic zone visibility. Wow, this is <laughs> this is yet another hack that I'm going to be happy to not have to do. I don't do videos on hacks. This is one of them that I haven't done. People keep asking, how do I change sheets? Um, you know, using a parameter. Well, this is going to hopefully do something like that, but I think it's going to take it to the next level. The key thing about this feature is that you can use it to control the dashboard elements not just using parameters, but also fields. I don't know if you can see this here at the bottom, fields. So what this suggests, and now this example is showing, is that I can generate a dashboard that has different charts for different items within a field. So you can see here they've got a data set with different uh, breeds. And when you select a cat, it actually changes charts and the images to a completely different viz. So this is a really, really nice uh, capability. It takes swapping sheets to the next level, in my opinion, because it means multiple sheets can be part of the same uh, dashboard object. In essence, they take the same space and all it's doing is swapping the sheets in and out. I think it's hopefully going to also be a much uh, more optimized way of doing this because I think adding parameters and swapping sheets, disabling things, that normally runs on a calculation level because you're essentially nulling out everything within a sheet. That has to run some computation, whereas this, I hope, is doing something smart to make that a little bit of a better experience. So let's go ahead and close that. Um, I mean, those three already are going to be pretty good. Uh, table extensions won't be used by many people, admittedly, but dynamic zone visibility data guide, those are going to be great. Um, dynamic scaling in a container. Now, this is not what you think it is for all the layout container uh, fans out there. Um, this is actually to do with um, Tableau Server and Tableau Cloud. So essentially being able to uh, work with um, Docker and scaling up and scaling down uh, Tableau uh, environments. So um, if you're an infrastructure nerd, this will mean a lot to you, but I'm not going to spend too much time on this. We'll probably come back to this uh, later in the future. I don't know enough about this to, to even start spitballing about it now. So let's just move on. Um, activity log in a Tableau server. So this is an interesting feature that was part of the advanced management add-on, I believe. And um, essentially what you get with Tableau Cloud and the advanced management add-on is this logging capability. What this looks like is the same feature for Tableau Server. And of course, this is a release now because Tableau Server only gets updates twice a year. So this is sort of a feature from last release, now in this release. That's something to be aware of. Tableau Server only gets releases twice a year, the first one of the year and the third one of the year. So every other release. And so um, this is essentially the same capability. What this allows you to do is essentially stores logs. Um, I think it stores it in an array, essentially like a JavaScript array. So that makes it much, much easier to sort of ingest uh, information into other systems, but also process them. Um, you can also store this stuff in various cloud technologies that are really good at handling this kind of data. And um, it says that it goes to a sort of a different level of granularity. So um, you can see here, um, goes above and beyond existing event data by exposing more events within your Tableau environment. By this, they're talking about Postgres. So Postgres already stores a lot of this on Tableau Server. If it goes well and beyond that, above, if it goes above and beyond that, then this might be able to tell you a lot more about what's going on. You'll probably then have to pass this and then put it somewhere and then process it and then analyze it. So if you're out there looking to build uh, a cool uh, workbook or accelerator for uh, the Tableau Exchange, then this is going to be a fantastic thing to dig into. Um, let's look at the next one. Ask data phrase recommendation. So. Again, I feel like this is a new one for Tableau Server, but it shouldn't actually be here. This was released in the previous uh, release of uh, uh, Tableau. So let me just let me just test something. If I go to Tableau Cloud and I see the Ask Data Phrase Builder in that list, then um, yeah, you can see Ask Data Phrase Recommendations in this list, but Ask Data Phrase Builder is for Tableau Server. So you know, this release is lighter than it looks because a lot of this, a lot of these features, they came out last release, but they're coming out now for Tableau Server. So if I go to Tableau Server and you look at this list, um, there's a lot of stuff in here that's uh, already available in uh, the previous release. Um, but that said, you know, that's maybe a bit unfair of me. There is a lot to unpack here. So let's just keep going through the full list and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll carry on. So we've done our uh, data phrase recommendations, modern sharing experience. What does this uh, mean? So let's go down. 
Ensure members in your organization are aware of and can access relevant content. So what this looks like is when you um, share something, it's not only going to send them an email, but actually check if they have permissions. And if not, if you have the ability to give them the permissions, it will actually let you do that. So you can, I think you can just about to see that here in this uh, sequence. Let's just wait for that. Yes, yeah, so you can see you can grant access there and off it goes. It's really sort of nice. It's just so obvious. This is sort of low hanging fruit. To me, this is the kind of stuff that you shouldn't ship the feature until it can do this because everyone expects this to be just the standard part of the feature. But nonetheless, it's here. That's really, really good to see. Okay, let's go to the next one. Collection site settings. So... Um, it looks like they're giving admins more control at a site level for collections, whether you can see them or not. This is sort of a weird one because if you had collections, everyone could see collections. If started using them, an admin turns up, switches them off. Everyone's like, oh, no, you've broken my flow. But don't worry. Um, if an admin disables them uh, and you lobby them to re-enable them, uh, the existing ones will come back. So it's not going to delete them for you. It's just hiding the capability. So that's that's cool to see. Um, a nice little bit of control for server admins uh, who, who need it. And um, when I say server admins, I also mean site admins as well. So um, bear that in mind. Copy dimensions as a measure. Oh, that's interesting. So what does this mean? Copy dimensions as a measure. Okay, let's dig into this. Get more flexibility when using a dimension as a measure within the same or different worksheet. Now with a quicker gesture, simply drag a dimension over the dimension. Wait, simply drag a dimension over the dimension measure. Separate it using the modifier key. Windows and the dimension will be copied as a measure. This is this got, got the word dimension too many times. It's doing my head in. Okay, let's try again. Get more flexibility when using a dimension as a measure within the same or different worksheet. Now with a quicker gesture. Okay, so this is this is basically this is what the feature is. I still don't get it. Let's see what they're doing. What are they doing? So you can drag it down and then across. But you can already do that. What what am I missing here? Customer goes down. Then across. So customers going down. Is this is this for web edit? I'm not sure if this is for web edit. Uh, what am I missing here? If you know what I'm missing, like <laughs> I feel real, real, really stupid here. Like, uh, what am I missing here? Let me know. What am I not getting here? I I, I swear you could already drag a dimension below that line. Yes, it turns up there, it does a count, and you drag it across, drop it in the view. Okay. Um, the dimension will be copied as a measure. There's a modify key. Windows, control, OSX command. We're going to have to try this. I have no idea. I have no idea what this gesture actually is. I'm sure it's, uh, it's, it's useful, but I just have no clue. I'm really sorry. Data pane follows you. Okay, what does this mean? We've streamlined the experience of organizing your data into hierarchies and folders. When you create a pane hierarchy or folder, the data pane automatically scrolls to the newly created hierarchy or folder position and selects it for you so you can continue interacting with it without having to stop. So you create a hierarchy, creates the folder, it puts it in the hierarchy, and, oh, it scrolls up to the hierarchy when it's created. Is this really a feature? I mean, come on. This is like an enhancement. This is not a feature. I mean, we, can, we can go on about this. Our features enhancement, enhancements of features. This, to me, is a, is a quality of life improvement, not a feature. So uh, let's go to the next one. Improved web authoring capabilities. Oh, okay, web authoring catching up. Change the data type. Uh, you can change the data type to the data pane in web authoring. Uh, web authors can now format the borders and dividers of totals and subtotals within a table. I'm telling you that web design march is strong. The web edit march is really strong. Tableau prep is already sort of web edit ready. Tableau desktop has been getting closer and closer. It's still not quite there. There are just few walls which you hit and when you hit them, you hit them hard. You have to download desktop and finish off anyway. So people just don't bother. But when they kind of just get the whole thing in the browser, that will be one big achievement. Let's go ahead and close this, go to the next one. Data stories on all data sources. Oh, interesting. How are they doing this there? How are they doing this? They're going to have to send the data somewhere. You can't just do this for free um, without having something process it. So you can now add automated language summaries to dashboards using data stories on the data source. When data 
When setting up data, you'll be notified that your data is sent to a cloud-hosted service. <laughs> Every tab or server admin is going to disable this straight away. If you'd instead like to restrict use of data stories, <laughs> case in point, administrators can disable this feature for all users through the site. That's the arc of this feature. I read about it. It sounded cool. I immediately thought of an issue. They thought of it too. They gave us a setting to switch it off. So there you go. That's what's going to happen for most people on Tableau Server. That said, on Tableau Cloud, this could be quite cool having this work. Um, you still, you're still probably going to have to answer the question of where is it sending the data to? How is that data handled? Is it cached? Does it clean it? What is Tableau doing with that data? All of that stuff. That's probably going to need to be detailed somewhere. So when the documentation for this comes out, we'll have to have a look and see what's in there. Let's go ahead to the next to the next feature. Let's go ahead and close this. Email and Slack notifications for explained data. Oh, this is nice. So um, what you can do is you can share the explanation in Slack or by email. Nice. That's it. That's pretty simple. So I think what happens here is if you share it with someone, it will send them an email and share also. Let me start again. If you share something with someone from explained data, if they have emails and Slack enabled, they'll get both. If they have one, they'll only get that one. But essentially, it's just saying, hey, Explain data can now send out notifications. So that's a, a pretty, pretty nice feature. Let's go ahead and close this. And uh, let's go up um, uh, email embedded API version 3.3. So the embedding API uh, went to version 3 fairly recently. I think at the very beginning of the year. And what they've been doing is they've been adding capabilities to it um, really, really quickly. I think they rewrote the embedding API from the ground up. It's sort of replacing the JavaScript API version 2. Uh, it's now called the Embedding API in version 3. So this is a much, much more improved uh, set of capabilities. I think it's going to bring embedding um, to hopefully to new heights in, in about a year when they start adding some of the aspirational things that cause them to want to rewrite the whole thing in the first place. Um, so that's going to be really, really cool. Um, it's obviously going to be need to be rewritten because of Tablet Cloud. Tablet Cloud is one of the biggest products. You still can't do embedding with Tableau Cloud. So I'm sure that this rewrite has probably got something to do with that. So let's let's wait and find out a little bit more. Personalize search results. OK, so the Tableau search experience continues to improve. Search now incorporates signals about your content preferences and personal viewing habits. Well, that sounds suspicious. These signals include the content that have been viewed in the past, content that you've favorited, and views that are recommended to you. Trust that the content relevant to you is at the top of your search results with all the new personalized search. In 2022.3, this is only supported for views, workbooks, metrics, and flows. Interesting. So it's basically taking into account your usage habits to inform the search. That makes sense. Uh, Google, when you go to it, depending on who you are, if you are used to searching certain things a lot, Google learns that and it will try and prioritize search results to suit you. When I search Tableau phrases, um, it knows what I'm talking about. But if my brother or my mother searches those same phrases, it comes up with completely different things because it knows they're not used to searching those things. So that's basically what we're seeing a bit of here inside of search. Uh, really nice touch. Resource monitoring tool for SMTP TLS improvement. Oh God, another crazy Tableau server ac acronym. So resource monitoring tool. Configuring an, an SMTP server connection with the resource monitoring tool is now easier with additional flexibility to disable, prefer, or require encryption. These options align more closely with those of Tableau Server, are easy to understand, and provide support for different SMTP configurations. Right, so I think what's going on here is that they're aligning... Let me just think about this again. Configuring an SMTP server connection with a resource monitoring tool, RMT, that's, a, um, that's not a free tool. That's something you have to pay to get, uh, the advanced management uh, capability gets you that is now easier with additional flexibility to disable prefer or require encryption uh with the ah, i'm not entirely sure what that means to be honest i don't know uh, this this bit gets me smtb server connection with the resource monitoring tool <sighs> i'm not sure if it's talking about the smtb connection in the resource monitoring tool so it can tell you what's going on or if they're actually talking about the smtp capabilities of tableau server and the resource monitoring tool. That's basically what I can't get clear in my in my head. But um, if you know the answer, let me know in the comments. Really appreciate it. Um, I will uh, try and get to that. I'll never get to this feature. <laughs> Who am I kidding? We will have a look at this feature when everything's launched. The documentation is clear. So improved Tableau prep conductor error messages. Ooh, I have to say, 
I think this is a server feature again. I'm not in 22.2. Apparently the errors were improving. Or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm I'm mixing up betas and I might be doing exactly that. Error messages in Tableau Prep are frustrating for two reasons. It's they just happen. Uh, if you've used Tableau Prep, they just happen. One of the biggest hindrances at the moment for me recommending Tableau Prep to people who run production level, you know, data pipelines who want to do it with Tableau Prep is you, the errors just come up all the time. <laughs> and, and and the funniest thing about that. <laughs> The thing that should let you know that I'm not lying to you is that Tableau themselves in this description literally say it out loud. To help you troubleshoot flow run failures with Tableau Prep Conductor, we've added over 400 error codes. <laughs> like, there shouldn't be that many for me to worry about. Um, and improved error messaging to provide clarity on root causes and troubleshooting steps. Yeah, I mean, oh gosh. I mean, in Tableau Desktop, I'm sure there's as many, but when you put the number right down on the marketing page, that kind of makes you think, wait a minute, why would there be 400 error codes, different error codes, I assume? Um, so if you can actually do anything about any of these error codes, that's normally the important thing. It's fine knowing what's wrong. It's difficult uh, not knowing why. So I wonder if these error codes help Tableau because you'll be creating support tickets, then you'll have a specific code to tell Tableau. I wonder if these errors will be uh, sent, you know, calling home. So when something breaks in Tableau and you've got the feature enabled to notify Tableau of errors, these error codes will be going back to them and maybe they can better diagnose the product to get that number down to, you know, double digits rather than in the hundreds. And that's my assumption there. I I'm not entirely sure about that. Right to CRM with Tableau Prep. So CRM Analytics, this is this was Einstein Analytics, which then became Tableau CRM, which is now CRM Analytics. You can now write to that platform from Tableau Prep. So Tableau Prep becoming a data prep tool that can now push information technically to the Salesforce system. So that's a pretty, pretty cool option. Column labor data quality warning. Oh, this is nice. Of course, this will come with a data management add-on. No way this is just uh, part of it. I think data quality warnings are part of the data management add-on. So more features behind the add-on. Data quality warnings can now be applied to the column level. Data quality warnings allow you to mark columns that are deprecated or stale and those that may be displaying incorrect values. When a data quality warning is configured, you can enable a high visibility warning across downstream assets to inform users of potential issues with the underlying data. So a high vis alert is essentially an alert that not only shows up when you look at it on Tableau server or Tableau cloud, when you are in desktop or when you're in prep, it actually gives you a little warning when you're using that field as well. It shows up in the product. So being able to add data quality warnings, not just on the whole data source, but to say, hey, this particular field it's got issues because of a, something we discovered last week. It's going to help a lot with data governance. Uh, I have to be honest, it's just one of those things where this is why the Tableau platform is magical, but why is it behind a like a, like a plugin? It's just so frustrating. So um, unless you have the data management add-on, which I know a lot of people don't necessarily have, you won't get this feature, but it's nice that you can do this kind of stuff. Just find a way of bundling the data management add-on within the products, please, Tableau. It's just, let's not make this good stuff go unused. It's a bit like Apple coming out with a bunch of features on their phone and then saying, oh, and by the way, um, you know, you can't use some features even though your phone can technically do these things. It's kind of what it feels like. External assets permissions improvements. Oh, hello. So um, external assets can now be moved into projects. This change democratizes metadata curation by utilizing existing project permissions to allow more users to manage description and data quality warnings. This removes site admins as a potential bottleneck and gives metadata ownership to users who know the data best. Additionally, this makes external assets more discoverable for content creators. So um, this is interesting. So essentially what this is uh, saying is that the external assets capabilities, wait a second, let's just Let's just external assets can now be moved into projects. Oh, I see, I see, I see. So external assets is something like a database, a table, anything that's basically not part of the Tableau platform is external. And so by extension, that can only really be um, you know, static files, uh, things like Excel files brought into Tableau, uh, tables, uh, databases, connections, virtual connections. These are all external assets. And they can now be brought into projects. And this allows people to change their metadata and see them in the in the list. So rather than just having them live in the external assets tab, which only site admins can see, 
Now they can be brought into projects so people who manage those connections, who manage those databases can go in, change the metadata, and projects start to become a little bit more useful in that sense. What I really like about this is that the concept of a site is sort of being diluted because we're pushing more and more power into individual projects. And so we're kind of seeing that uh, capability sort of uh, flesh out, which is really nice to see. Uh, virtual connection improvements, downstream feature compatibility. Users can now configure subscriptions, alerts, and thumbnail generation for assets that leverage data sources. Right, right. So basically, previously, if you used the virtual connections, these capabilities weren't possible. Now, if you um, use a virtual connection, they are possible. Again, data management add-on. I'm um, sorry about that. Ex extract encryption. Tableau server customers can choose to force extract encryption at the site or server level, similar to extracts not contained within a virtual connection. So I think this was already happening in cloud. This is now coming to server. Okay, let's go to the next one. Cloud-based file connectors for virtual connections. So file connectors, Box, Dropbox, Google Drive, and Microsoft Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2. I don't know what Data Lake Storage Gen 2 is. Oh, sorry, that's one long phrase. Microsoft Azure Data Log Storage. Try again. Microsoft Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2. Okay, that's a really catchy title. Um, essentially, these are now going to be possible with the virtual connection. This is nice, actually, because quite a lot of people in companies, especially if you're a um, very small company or you know very modern company, use Box and Dropbox as storage mechanisms. And yeah, being able to connect to data sets in those places is going to be super handy. Uh, it's probably going to be much easier than using something like SharePoint, uh, uh, in all honesty. So yeah, that's, that's going to be nice, especially if it's behind a virtual connection. New accelerators on Tableau Exchange. As I said, Tableau Exchange keeps growing. They keep adding new accelerators. Um, they've added new ones, and they've done major upgrades on the existing ones. Let's check out what they mean by major upgrades. I'm always, I'm always intrigued. Sometimes this marketing stuff is just, it's just so deceptive. Um, okay, I mean, I, I've always, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm very critical of uh, a lot of the stuff on the Tableau Exchange and extensions. Uh, sorry, accelerators in particular, because a lot of them. Um, I don't think they follow best practice design. So if you go on the exchange, what they have started doing is adding some fantastic um, extensions. Sorry, I keep saying extensions. Fantastic accelerators on the exchange um, done by partners. Uh, and you can see people on Tableau Public kind of angling to get themselves in this sort of line of work as well. So be sure to look out for that as well. So these are getting better. And um, I have to give Tableau credit where it's due. They're doing the work. What you have to remember with every platform, this is probably what I haven't said enough, is that when you start out, you have to be scrappy. You have to get things up rather than perfect. So um, it's good to get things up. People can critique them. Uh, they can start offering value to someone because if all you're worried about is design, well, what Tableau have done here with the connections, I just smacked my mic, apologies for that. And uh, what Tableau have done here with the connections is they've got everything set up for you. So you can kind of use that connection in that workbook as a resource. What I would love is to be able to break down these assets into the atomic bits. So let's say I see this workbook and I see, oh wow, they're calculating the weighted pipeline value. In order to do that, they must have created the relationship between this table, this table, this table. Well, could I just borrow the connection from this workbook? And you can grab the connection and do whatever you want with it, knowing the logic in there enables you to calculate a specific measure or being able to pick a shopping list of measures and say, oh, I would like to download a workbook with just these measures in them. And then when you download the workbook, it doesn't give you the design of the dashboard because it needs other metrics, but you just get a ready to go workbook, literally hot off the press, and you can just start building stuff. And then the really, really smart stuff is when Tableau updates this stuff to meet new logic or new capabilities in Salesforce or other platforms, those changes, can kind of be pinged to you as the author of a workbook to say, hey, uh, these changes have been made to the original asset. Uh, do you want to bring them down into your workbook? Now, I know that's a pretty complicated set of sort of sequences to get, and the Tableau platform probably isn't ready for that, but that's, that's the kind of stuff that's really powerful here. When you can scale work through the platform, that's going to be, uh, that's where time savings come from. That's just, just a really important part of how everything works. Improve sharing in Tableau Mobile. Okay, you can now share content with other Tableau users in Tableau Mobile to ensure you're working off the same information. Recipients will receive a notification and have shared content appear in the Shared With Me section. It's pretty nice. Web Data Connector version three. There's a new, uh, there's now a new developer experience for creating connectors to web application data via APIs. 
Web Data Connector version 3 provides a toolkit with everything you need to develop a connector in a single package. Additionally, Web Data Connectors are now TACO files. Ah, oh, okay, so that's kind of cool. TACO files are the standard file format for all connectors on Tableau Exchange. And uh, if you use the uh, Connector SDK, which is a software development kit for building a connector that Tableau can use to connect to a data set, they also create a TACO. So the TACO is becoming the standardized file format for connecting to anything, whether it's Web Data Connector or Connector SDK itself. So that's really, really good to see. SharePoint list. So what happened in the previous releases uh, is they brought around a new SharePoint uh, file connector, essentially. This is an enhancement to the SharePoint list capability. So with the new connector in Tableau Cloud and uh, the Tableau Exchange, oh, let me read that again. With a new connector for SharePoint list in Tableau Cloud and the Tableau Exchange. Oh, okay, the SharePoint list connector must be in the Tableau Exchange then. Users can now access data in SharePoint lists directly from Tableau. This connector also supports Azure AD authentication. I have to check that out. Uh, improvements on uh, Ask Data. We continue to extend the availability of Ask Data. Adding Ask Data to a dashboard is now smoother than ever, supported end to end in Tableau Desktop. So this is great. You don't have to you know, go off somewhere else to add Ask Data to your dashboard, essentially. Um, we increase the flexibility to manage Ask Data inside dashboards. Analysts can decide to show or hide Ask Data. For oh, okay. This was in 2022.2. It's now on Tableau Server. See, uh, it even says it. Previous release in Tableau 2022. This is now available for server in 22.3. I keep getting called out by this stuff. Um, metrics improvements. Create metrics to track key data points without having to access your dashboard and edit them at any time. You can now come back and edit existing metrics to change the historical comparison period the date range used by the metric and the status indicators. Additionally, you can dynamically explore different date windows whilst analyzing the metric without editing configuration. Okay, so previously, ah, oh, again, <laughs> it's just two in a row. I got caught out, done in 22.2, now in 22.3 for Tableau Server. This is the same. Yeah, this is the same. So I think these last few are secretly all uh, yeah, these are all previously released. So I'm not going to go through these uh, in detail because th these are all part of the In fact, I probably have videos for all of these already. Um, in uh, I actually do have videos for some of those already. So um, this is a new one. And the following connector is available now on the Tableau Exchange. Firebolt. Let's go check that out. Uh, what is Firebolt? Um, Firebolt Analytics. Firebolt Connector Tableau is... Uh, let's, let's, can we go to Developer? Let's go to the developer website um, talk to us. Firebolt, Firebolt, boom, lots of Firebolt. Engineer, sub-second and analytics experience. Wow, sub-second. I don't think I could think in sub-second speed, so that won't help me. Uh, faster than anything you've seen at data lake scale. I love how everything in analytics is about speed, but I'm just a humble person. <laughs> I don't work anywhere near as fast as uh, the people here uh, have aspirations for me to work as fast. <laughs> so everything is always about speed, scale, agility. Oh, God, it's just, it's always funny how marketing works, isn't it? So um, uh, that's that. Let's go back. Um, I think that's it, that we've done the list uh, without realizing it. If I go back here, maybe I lost my, oh, there's the coming soon page. So. That is everything in the release. What a funny set of releases, hey? So again, I think this list is shorter in real terms once you take out all the stuff that was previously in 22.2 and is now in 22.3. That said, there are some good features in here, um, really, really good. What I will do, I will do a video analyzing like what percentage of these features are behind a paywall. By that, I mean you have to purchase a uh, additional product um, Tablet generally hate the term add-on. They call them add-ons when they launch, and then they sort of remove that from all their marketing. They don't want you to think of it as an add-on. Um, but, you know, it is an additional expense. Some of them are charged based on the number of users, so there's a certain price per number of users. Um, and the pricing constantly changes. So Tablet's obviously clearly trying to find the right place for all of these products. But nonetheless, um, yeah, that's pretty much the whole set of features. Okay, so there we have it, all the features in this release. Um, it's been super interesting. It has taken a bit longer to get here. I don't know why, but it felt... <laughs> Dog's here, but we're going to carry on anyway. Uh, it's felt like it's taken a lot longer to get these features out. I don't know what happened to the uh, beta program in this particular release. 
Um, there's definitely a lot of fluctuation in the way the pre-release mechanism is being handled. And it just means a sort of more inconsistent sort of release cadence. Because what, what normally happens with the pre-release is that and people get hold of it and these features sort of trickle out and you can actually get a little bit of uh, feedback and response from the community. I've always wondered how many people actually channel that community in a constructive way. I'm sure that's probably a problem that Tableau well are aware, well aware of. And for the record, Tableau do actually consult people when they're building these features. They don't just turn up with them. Um, if you're part of the uh, community program, um, Tableau do actually reach out to members of the community and ask them, hey, what do you think of this feature? Quite a lot of the features in this release I've actually seen before myself as part of that program. So they're not 100% new to me, um, but it's always interesting what makes it to the final release and how it's packaged, which is why earlier on I said, hey, um, some of this stuff is interesting because it's actually multiple features packaged into one feature. I think Data Guide is a really, really good one. So that's going to be really interesting to see how it all lands. The other thing is, of course, uh, capabilities behind uh, additional products as Tableau would like to call them. And um, that's also going to be an interesting dynamic once people realize, hey, these are all the features. And by the way, um, because I'm a server customer, I didn't get 22.2. So not only am I not getting uh, the features I should get, but actually a lot of the features in 22.2 were Tableau cloud specific. And some of the features in this release are also cloud specific. So it feels like if you're a server customer, you're getting half the number of features as you would naturally expect. It's a little bit of stick and carrot. Of course, Tableau would love you to move to the cloud where they can serve you all of these wonderful features, but nonetheless, um, it is what it is. So uh, in this release, when the features come out, we'll do the videos as always. Now, because the uh, pre-release wasn't so forthcoming, when the new release comes out, uh, the videos will take a bit of time to come out. Normally what I do is before the actual release, because I have the pre-release and I can test these features, as long as the features are stable, I actually make some of the videos ahead of time. The stuff that really works well, I'll make those videos ahead of time so that on launch day, one or two days after, I can get these things out. However, that's kind of tricky now and because <laughs> you kind of need time to try these things out. So what I'll probably do is try and cover one feature every single day. The other thing I have an issue with is YouTube. Actually, YouTube hates it when I publish all my videos in one day. And by hate it, I mean it won't notify and won't show you those videos for a really long time. So if I, for example, post five videos and you follow me and you even tick the allow notifications, there's only like 10% or so of people actually tick that. It'll only notify you of one of my videos in a given period of time. And that's completely arbitrary based on your usage of YouTube and so on and so forth. And so uh, it, you could easily go four or five days after I posted a video without knowing that I've actually posted five or 10 videos about the new release. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to only release one video every single day. But here's a catch. I will have all the videos available immediately inside of the playlist for that release. So if you go to my public 2022.3 playlist, if you look in that list, as I make the videos, they'll be available there, but they'll be unlisted. So essentially it's like I've made the video public, but I've actually not promoted it. And then when it goes live, they become, they don't, they're not unlisted anymore and they can go out to the community. And because I'm doing that every day, hopefully more people should see those as it goes out. The last thing is also, why have I not made videos for a long time? Well, so many things, so many things. As you can see, the arrangement in the room is slightly different. I used to sit facing that way and decided to sit facing this way. A whole bunch of, uh, you know, set up uh, logistic, logistic stuff in my room. I pride my setup a lot. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a tech lover. I love technology. And so I spend a bit of time rechanging my setup for very little value, but actually it makes it more enjoyable for me to sit here at this desk recording videos, do work when I'm at work and uh, just, you know, have thoughts and think about things. The other thing is I actually been doing some work for a company that I can't say too much about until December. Um, but what I will say is um, if you want to find out more about what that is, uh, follow me, not just here on YouTube, of course, and Twitter and the usual places, but especially on LinkedIn. So in December, hopefully I'll be able to share a lot more with you about what that is. Uh, I'm super excited for it. I spent a lot of time working on it in the last month or so. Uh, the lead time for this has been like over a year. You know, the discussions for this started last year and it's only now that we're actually getting everything across the finish line. So super, super excited to see how that lands, how you guys uh, find that and what you think of it. Um, now, as we go to the end of the year, this is always when stuff gets exciting. This is this to me is always the start of the new year for me. And um, in November, I'm probably going to 
change things up a lot because uh, I'll have a lot more time on my hands. I'll, I'll say more about why I have more time on my hands in November, specifically in November. Um, but when I get there, I'm going to be making a lot more content um, kind of following on that promise of talking more about Autrex and Snowflake, essentially. So I have a setup. I've got some content ideas. I've got a content plan. We're going to get through that. And so that's essentially what I've been doing. So although it's been quiet for the last uh, few weeks, it's not been quiet at all in by any measure. And uh, of course, I'm also a recent dad. So spending time with the family, that's uh, always number one. Uh, and so that's uh, that's pretty much taken most of my time. That's why I've got these uh, uh, dark circles behind my eyes. I have to switch on. I actually have lighting underneath uh, the table to make sure these shadows don't show up so bad. If I, oh, there's a doorbell. If I, <laughs> technology. If I switch these off, uh, <laughs> you can see the slightly less flattering look that I get because of these circles. So there's a little bit of movie magic for you uh, there to see there. But anyway, thank you for watching. Thank you for staying until the end. Um, if you stayed all the way till the end, you're going to get something special. All the wonderful bloopers that I cut out my videos. I'm going to start leaving it at the end for everyone who watches this channel as a little treat. Uh, and thank you for staying until the end. So you can really see what goes on behind the craziness that is editing on the Tablet Tim channel. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next one. Hopefully you can't hear the dog. <laughs> I'll just get going. Maybe not. Am I clear? Maybe I am. I think I am. Let's go.